people's bows at a minimum were 80 pounds. So the very smallest of the bows recovered from the Mary Rose were 80 pounds, and more than 80% of them were 110 to 145 pounds. So we're talking two to three times the weight of this. And so I have a stave here, and this is elm, which is second-rate wood by medieval standards. They would have liked to have used you. Um, but this guy is thick enough and has the mass of one of the Mary Rose bows. So imagine that. I mean, it's just a big, ugly, clunky thing. But it does have some flex to it. And it takes my whole body weight to give any flex to those limbs. But and it is, as described, it's a functional piece. It's not something intended for embellishment and everything. And I think people have this idea of English medieval archery as like these guys had their military bows at home and they were practicing with their military bows and then they took their home equipment with them. And it really wasn't that way. They did have practice bows in that weight range, but their military bows would have been issued to them by the government standard like armament today. And then, yeah. So you're mentioning bow pounds. I'm wondering if you could explain what that means. Okay, They're not, you know, the bow doesn't weigh 150 pounds. Right, okay. So, as far as pounds of resistance is what I'm talking about. So when you have a strong bow, we can measure the force of resistance between the string and the middle of the bow in foot pounds of force. So that's what they're talking about. And this bow for me is, um, I mean, it's not too heavy. It's, it's a good, comfortable weight. But like I said, this is a third of the weight that they would have been pulling on the regular or close to it. So if you imagine this kind of ease of use where I can just pull this sucker back and use it, but it's that, <laughs> it's, it's this guy that they're pulling back that far and using. And so there's a sort of arms race that ends up happening because necessarily as the English develop this new power, like I said, in 1285, they required that everyone 15 and older have a bow, know how to use it, and have a certain number of arrows. So they're already cultivating a sort of culture around archery that just doesn't exist in other countries. We have writings on archery from the period from France, but they mostly center around hunting and that sort of thing. They don't really touch on war here. So the English already, I mean, Crossbows had been around for this by this point for several hundred years. This was not new technology either. But crossbows are much more expensive than a long bow. So I do have one, and this one is in the 1300s, a really 1400s pattern with steel prod. And they were often incredibly powerful, many times the weight that a person can actually cock on their own. This one is near 200 pounds, and even with the cocking assembly that goes on my waist, I can barely pull the thing back with my back. So it would still take a pretty formidable person to cock and use this in combat. Um, but this is a complicated weapon, and compared to a single stave of wood with a couple of pieces of horn on it, it's a very, very expensive weapon. And that's something England simply couldn't afford at the point that the longbow became solvent. And really, the longbow only enjoys its pride of place for about 150 years before it's mostly outmoded. So what we end up seeing is that it's cost effective and it raises the number of potential combatants. So if you can equip a certain number of people with bows, you can keep your enemy at a distance and just continually pepper them with shots and not have to actually engage them in melee combat. And that's kind of how the English like to play things when the longbow reaches its prime. So they're often... Oh, I'm at the wrong point. Oh, sorry guys. <laughs> 
So the very first time that we see the longboat effectively win a battle for the English is at Cressy in 1346. Um, and then we see it again at Poitiers in 1356, just 10 years later, under similar command. Um, and Poitiers is a seriously damaging loss for the French. They, their king is captured during that battle. So John II is captured during that battle, and the English use him as a bargaining chip to get pieces of gas back from the French, basically, because they're always losing border pieces from Aquitaine to France and then getting them back and whatever else. But in 1356, we start to see them dig into this sort of battle habit that they have with the English longbow, because the English longbow is not an offensive weapon. As tactically great as it is to have in combat, it's very difficult to deploy ahead of troop movements. So it's most effective when it's deployed from a defensive position. So the English tend to pitch their battles that way on purpose, where they can dig in somewhere and create a defensive position. Because their longbowmen are not equipped with the sort of plate armor that we see on knights, or even the composite armor, like brigandines and that sort of thing. Oftentimes the only well-equipped archers that would have been on the battlefield would have been retainer archers, who were under the direct command and A of a lord who was significantly paying them more than the government. <laughs> uh, but they were sometimes equipped a little bit better, but really what you could expect to see as an archer was padded armor, quite a bit, and chain mail even into the late 1400s. I mean, they were still using chainmail for archers um, into the 1500s. So I have one of these, and this guy actually, when I put it on, wraps all the way around, ties under the chest. It's a whole assembly with all these ties and things. Um, and then this is pretty protective from flying things and the occasional swing. But you're not expecting your archers to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat that often. They're not going to be super well armored. Um, occasionally, toward the end of the 1400s, we see them in den plate with the little. I don't. I actually don't know all the terms for this, so maybe this is a Jerry question. Eight armor. From eight 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 armor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we see them get better armor toward the end of the century, but. Crossbowmen in general have been better armored the entire time because they tend to see direct combat. So crossbowmen get used in situations by the French and occasionally even by the English that they don't use their longbowmen because crossbowmen are a big sheep. So crossbowmen are equipped with this super technical piece of equipment that by the middle 1400s could draw in excess of 1,200 pounds. They had to use this windlass crank to draw this thing. So they send two people out, one usually teenager with a bucket of bolts to help operate the thing and set up the shield, and then the actual crossbowman who would crank the sucker up and launch bolts 400 yards distant into castle-bound men. Um, and so they faced a lot more direct combat than the longbowmen generally did. But yeah, so they would have maybe these breaks. I have seen period illustrations where it seems like they're in little more than a tunic and a hood, honestly. And there are French accounts at Agincourt of archers who had gone into battle sans pants. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's another whole story. So at Agincourt, um, and I'll get to that in a minute. I gotta keep to my <laughs> uh, not reveal story points before they're applicable. <laughs> Uh, the very last thing that I'll say about armor is that this is a German salad. So this would have been maybe not common on the battlefield for archers, but if you were well equipped, this might be something you had. This one opens, many of them do not. Uh, many of them are a single piece with this bever here. Um, and that provides a lot of 
protection. And I can still see, I can still draw my bow. There's not a lot going on down here and they would have likely had a male collar here to protect them below. But most archers in the service of the king weren't even equipped this well. They had what's called skull cap, which is just an iron cap that fits nice and tight. And they would wear a wool cap underneath it and then their iron cap on top. Um, so Poitiers in 1356 gets to the In case they did get into hand in hand, hand combat with the archers of carrying a sidearm? Yes, absolutely. Um, so sidearms for archers are quite varied and we see very different counts. Uh, so for Agincourt, they're equipped with what are called hangers. Uh, nobody really defines what a hanger is in the medieval texts that I've seen, at least as it relates to archers, but from what I've heard and read, it's a short sword, basically, of some kind. Maybe single-edged, like a falchion, maybe double-edged, like a sword. <laughs> um, but they also equip themselves with a variety of things in combat, uh, and the French mentioned that they used the lead mallets that they used to pound their stakes in. So, and that's something that I need to get to with, <coughs> with Poitiers and that development. Um, but they use these big five foot handle on a 10 pound ball, lead mallet, to pound these six foot stakes in in front of them so that the horses can't charge it. But during Agincourt, there was a crush at the front of the battlefield. As people died in the front rows, as the archers picked them off and the men at arms picked them off, it created a problem because these people are piling up in front and now people are piling behind them and creating this press. So part of the reason they were so effective is because they got 3,000 men in the mud and they got them to press into each other like that. And then the archers, despite being very poorly armored, like I said, we're using chain mail and aventails and leather occasionally into the 14 and 15 hundreds. But these guys go, what better weapon do I have than a 10 pound block of lead on the end of a five foot pole? And they start swinging it. And it turns out that even the best French armor doesn't stand up to 10 pounds on the end of a five foot pole. <laughs> So they start denting them in like tin cans and then stabbing them with daggers. And that's pretty much the go-to for English archers as far as hand-to-hand -hand combat goes. When they are forced into hand-to-hand -hand combat, they try to make it on their own terms. They, they do everything that they can to even the playing field because they're not armored. Uh, but they're generally equipped with a short sword to start with. Many people will carry other things with them as well. So if you pick, if you're a veteran, um, a lot of these archers were contract and they were hundred they were involved in the Hundred Years War. So these are repeated battles over the course of years and years. Some of them were very, very well experienced people who would have picked up things from the battlefield, who have picked up other stuff. And I can't say that they were all armored the same or all equipped the same, but they certainly all got the same thing from the government if they were on government payroll. It's good enough for government work. <laughs> Um, but they also saw service as mercenaries. Even during the Hundred Years' War, when things were in a little bit of a lull, the English crown would lend out its archers to... <laughs> Which, I mean, it's, it's kind of odd by modern standards, but English archers saw use at Nicopolis in 1396 in Turkey. Um, they fought with the Bourbon French in Turkey because at the time France was split between two separate factions. Some of them were English sympathetic and some of them were not. So some of them contracted with English longbowmen who unfortunately did not make it home as the French lost the Battle of Nicopolis and famously several thousand captives. <laughs> Uh, but they also received service in Nahara in 1367 in Spain, 
um, during the, the wars of, um, what is this guy's name? Trastamara, Enrique Trastamara and his brother um, engaged in a civil war in Spain over the crown. One ends up choking the other one to death in person. Um, and then somehow the Black Prince gets involved and ends up backing Enrique Trastamara and brings several thousand English archers and several hundred, I think it was like 800 to 1,000 English men at arms, um, to Nahara, where he catches an illness that he never loses and eventually dies of. So it's, that one's not a great time. Um, but then as before in 1415, the English used their archery to their advantage. And like I said, they're very good at setting up a defensive position because that's what archery necessitates, basically. You have to have your enemy at a distance or it's not effective because if they can charge through you, your ability to drop a mass amount of projectiles on an area is significantly less. If somebody has to be defending themselves, they can't be shooting at the enemy. Um, so what the English do at Agincourt is they take note of the fact that it's very muddy in this hollow and they move up to abut that hollow so that there's this big mud wallow in front of them. And then they deploy six foot stakes, which I mentioned Nicopolis earlier and it doesn't sound like it's super pertinent, but they learned that method from Turkish archers at Nicopolis who deployed stakes to defend themselves from horsemen. Um, so they saw that, they brought that home because in, at Poitiers in 1356, the archers did defend themselves similarly, but they dug a small trench and tipped their wagons over in front of themselves. So it was more like they built a wall to shoot from behind it, instead of, these things are probably pretty difficult to see until you're right up on them. Um, so what they would do, they moved up 300 yards and necked off the woods on either side, so there's no escape to either side of their line. Then they dug a three foot deep trench, and then they put six foot tall stakes right behind it. So as you charge up on them, you're ideally not going to see the trench, maybe see the stakes. Um, and it's just, it's a nasty process. But it's something that they seem to have incrementally learned over time. It's not something they just came up with. It's an advancement of that technique from earlier, of shielding their archers from direct combat. Um, sorry. You want to get Jerry? This is my I'm watching a documentary face. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I was like, I'm going to take a minute. <laughs> To me, the knowing things. Despite the fact that, like I said, it's not from the heyday of English longbows, which is kind of prior to that. So with Mary Rose, we're looking at 1535. Sort of the supremacy of England in land battles ends in about 1452. Um, they lose horribly to the French in Gascony. They lose Gascony in 1452, and that's about the end of their land supremacy in France. But the bow remains for several decades a very solvent battle tactic, especially at sea, where everything is flammable. So they have stored on board over 500 longbows and over 12,000 arrows 
when she sank, and she rolled right over into the sill. So those things were preserved so well that when it was eventually raised, they were able to dry out some of the longbows, buy new horn knocks, put a string on them, and shoot them. Who would do that? 400 years underwater, <laughs> the English. Okay? They do a lot of things with artifacts that I'm not going to tell, including take them other places that they're not from. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but in this particular case, their horse is their rodeo, <laughs> and they had 500 of them. I think they strung three, if I remember right. I, like, if you've got this a lot of things... I can see it from both perspectives. I can see it from the engineer wanting to know if the thing still works and how. Because if you look at it, it's they, they have to have done their research beforehand to know if it was going to explode on them. I hope. I really hope. I, I, I shouldn't hope that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those bows. But yeah, so those bows, despite being a little after the date that we're looking at, are some of the only existing bows that are still around for us. Because they were held in an elastic environment at the bottom of the solid for so long, they offer a window into carving techniques of the day, into bow making techniques of the day. I mean, the bows are far more varied than we would have expected. The modern, there's a new. There's an organization now called the EWBS, the English War Boat Society, and they set out a series of 13 rules that a war boat has to go by or it's not a war boat, according to them. Um, and after analysis, almost none of the war boats found on the Mary Rose actually fit their, their, modern, <laughs> their modern interpretation of what a war boat should be. Absolutely, almost none of them do. And they come in 17 different processes. So <coughs> we're expecting this standardized sort of deep profile, round in the belly, flat on the back. And many of them just aren't that. They're oval, or some of them are square with knocked off corners. Some of them are narrowed in the handle and wider out in the limbs, like we would expect from a flatter body. Uh, but a lot of that comes down to the bow maker themselves and what they're comfortable with. Because as a bow maker myself, I'll tell you, my English long bows don't fit here to the EWBS either. Because at the weight that I generally make them at, at 50, 60 pounds, I can't adhere to their standards. It won't adhere to their standards. Um, but their standards are a little bit of a mismatch. And at the time, we see a whole lot more variance in the style of bows, the length of bows. Uh, but those Mary Rose bows that they offer this window into their building techniques. Uh, we've even found a couple of horn knocks. There aren't very many left because they tend to dissolve, not dissolve, but kind of deteriorate in the way that you would dust because it's inherently toxic. It's <laughs> very toxic. I'm pretty sure that's why it didn't deteriorate down there for so long. Um, but in any case, it offers this new view because it's sort of frozen in time. They withdrew 535 bows from the Mary Rose and over 12,000 arrows, bunch of heads, even fletches. Sitting, all sorts of things. It's, um, and the tragedy of it is, the only other bows that we have from that period, there are two of them, and one of them is maybe dubious, and maybe from the 1800s. Uh, there's a bow in Sudbury that is supposed to be from the 1300s, but everybody who has dated the bow has dated the work techniques to the 1600s and to thereby a forgery. Mm. So, and it was maybe updated in the 1800s. Do you have a question? No. No. Sorry. <laughs> so, I just thought maybe because you had that quizzical look on your face, I was like, if you've got a question, I'll answer it. <laughs>
Um, so the Sudbury bow that is an ancient bow, the 4,500 year old bog Sudbury bow, I, is not a thing. That's a, that's a different thing. Yeah. So there was one that was found in a priory in Sudbury, and it's like three quarters of a bow. It's always a fragment with these things. You never find the whole thing. Sure. Like even the the Mere Heath bow. Uh, which is probably the oldest English bow ever found was a fragment, again, it was a piece of a limb and then a piece of hand, and they assembled what they knew of it from that. Um, but that's what makes it very difficult to date some of these things. So we have that and then we have an arrow that is from 1435 that was shot into the roof of a monastery by an errant archer, and then confiscated so at the archer fight. <laughs> <laughs> and the monastery held on to it for comedic effects, apparently. <laughs> 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 um, Alright, does anybody in the crowd have any questions? You said that there's a uh, type of writing that is mm -hmm. you know, throughout history, like it's kind of cool when you talk about how like Right. Um, do the arrows change quite a bit over time? Quite a bit, yes. And I should have gotten to this sooner, honestly, because I have a bunch of arrows. <laughs> um, so I think I showed you guys this one earlier, and this head is specifically designed to pierce chain mail. These heads are called bodkins, and it's kind of a general term. In the day, they were not called bodkins. That's a modern term that we apply to them because they're shaped like a point of the needle. Um, but in the day, these arrows themselves were called bickers, which is where the term bickering comes from. <laughs> so there's an old English poem talking about archers of Kent bicker upon the bat. They're shooting arrows at each other on a hill. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> I, I, did, I did unnecessary hours of research into this. <laughs> but yeah, so back in the day, these are called the bicker. But we also have heads like that. And that's not meant to go through art, clearly. Every head has its purpose. Um, and if you have an assortment, like an archer who carries arrows at his side, they were usually issued 27 arrows. Um, and they vary from arrow to arrow. It's not like they had 27 of the same arrow. Um, it, there was a specific makeup to them. And so I have, I have reproductions that are scaled down because at original size, these suckers are spears. I, I, I can't shoot them out of a bow at original size and hope that they go anywhere consistent. Uh, so these are two-thirds replicas. So this has that bodkin point on it. It's rounded and pointed. And toward the end of the English longbow era, they start to get this sort of heavy fronted look to them, and they become what's called a lozenge bodkin. It's more oval in shape. Yeah, I don't know why they call it that. One of like the historical context behind the lozenge is so, like I just know that it's a Like, but they do kind of look like that. They have this heavy forward-facing kind of chisel-shaped look because um, those are designed to punch a hole in plate metal. Um, and the long, slender um, these these points were sometimes two to three times this length before the English longbow was really. In effect, it could sometimes be out that long because they're intended to be this long, thin needle and spread the links of chainmail. But after chainmail loses its privacy in the battlefield, that's not as effective. So they go to either armor piercing rounds, and you asked earlier about the, the rate of fire. So that's where longbows become very effective again over crossbows on the battlefield because they have such a rate of fire. So if you get something that can pierce armor, and you can shoot six to ten arrows a minute, you can throw 235,000 arrows at your enemy in under 15 minutes with 2,500 archers. <laughs> 
Yes. So, um, question kind of piggybacking on that. You said that there's like what, two thirds, one third the size, and that you yeah. can't shoot their yep. actual arrows? I can't shoot their actual arrows. How were they with accuracy then? So, their arrows were proportionally bigger because their bows were proportionally bigger. Okay. So, I can only shoot these because my little 50 pound bow will not shoot their quarter pound okay. war arrow. This guy is maybe two thirds the size and probably half the weight of their war arrows. They were absolute tree trunks. Half an inch at the front and three eighths of an inch at the back. Oh, crap. 1,250 grains in weight for those of you who reload or anything and know what that is. Quarter pound. Yes, Archer's Paradox. So part of the reason that I can't shoot those big tree trunk arrows is because arrows flex when they go past the bow. So if I put something on my bow that's not going to flex, it's going to fly at whatever any direction it comes off the bow as it leaves. And I'm not going to get any real accuracy. So I can't shoot them for one thing because they're too heavy for me and they don't go very far. <laughs> it's almost pathetic shooting a full weight arrow out of a, a minimal weight bow and watching it just kind of <laughs> like that. But because of Archer's Paradox, so as the arrow passes the bow, it flexes back and forth like this. And the arrow has to be able to do that in harmony with the weight of the bow. So they were made especially large because the bows these men were shooting were especially large. They were absolutely massive, and being able to deliver that much weight on impact had its advantages against armor. Even so it could still be accurate. Right. Yep. Yeah. And so their accuracy was based less on pinpoint accuracy on, and more on what they called keeping a length. So being able to drop your arrows at a particular distance was more advantageous to them than being able to pick somebody out at 50 yards and hit them. Yes? Pure curiosity, but I'm a visual person. Mm -hmm. How big are these art, like, size Archers? wise? Yeah, just curious. They are big men. I <laughs> <laughs> so, a visual, though. <laughs> so, a lot bigger than me. Jerry size. Jerry size. Jerry size. Drunk on way too much beer. They were, they were given up to a gallon a day at times. Oh my gosh. The Germans who served with them described them as insatiably thirsty and irascibly unfriendly. <laughs> <laughs> and stinky. They, they also said they smelled like a pig's die. But yeah, so. They were not men that I would want to meet in a darkened alley, <laughs> ever. Um, but they also were not poor little peasants. So one thing that people tend to think is that because these were commoners, we're talking about peasants who row, row a row of radishes for a living. They were usually actually okay to do. We're talking about independent contractors making the equivalent of a pretty good wage today to sell their lives to a lord for several months, which, I mean, it, it honestly makes sense. But lots of these guys were very large. They trained for their job or they did something else that was physical. Well, I guess that's where that the, kind of labor. the question came from, because, I mean, if they have to be that size, right. it generally means well-fed. Well-fed in medieval times generally means you're fairly good off, so I was having right. a hard time. And that's the thing. thing. So the best of archers were often container archers. They weren't your classic peasant with a bow. They had a family and a household themselves. They worked for a knight and were a man at arms for him, essentially. And those retainer archers were very well to do. Like I said, it kind of runs the gamut. It's a well paid job by medieval standards. Um, and oftentimes, archers will choose to go on campaign somewhere else and sell their services as a mercenary rather than go home and hoe a row again. Um, and the English actually complain about this repeatedly, that their men during the late, the mid-1400s are leaving to go to other countries to fight because they're not fighting with the French enough. <laughs> and then they fight with the French too much, and in 1452 they lose their last French wars. So, um, yes? 
just a quick, because I'm hearing two things. I'm hearing one that says mm -hmm. the edict that everyone has to have a bow and arrow too. Right. And then I'm hearing you say, no, these were well off people. So, so I'm hearing two different. So, <laughs> so here's the, the thing about their recruitment ideal of the day. If you need soldiers, take your best trained, take your best equipped first, and then take everybody else second. So they, they were separated into tiers. <laughs> even, yeah, it, it kind of is like that, though. So they were separated into sort of tiers. Like at Agincourt, course, Sir Thomas Irvingham is placed in charge of 4,500 archers. He can't possibly be there to administer to all of them. There has to be other officers below him that are administering those things, and they kind of run the gamut because we see lords individually issue their retainer archers armor and arms and things that are of higher quality than you would expect for government issue. And men who were in retainers expected to get those things as perks. Um, they expected to be paid better than the government rate for that. And they were rewarded for their skill and their size and their ability in combat with oftentimes greater pay or greater opportunities. Um, so many of the English archers, not all, like I said, some of them were unlanded. Um, but that edict that I listed earlier from 1285 specifically lists a certain amount of land that you have to own or you're exempt from it. So it's tiered, and I don't think I explained that earlier. I'm sorry about that. Um, but the person has to own a certain amount of acreage, and then they're required to have X, Y, and Z in reserve for their military service. So it's sort of like having a social contract and a standing National Guard at the time of like, you at least have a sword and a bow, please practice with it. And later on, we get a lot more laws reinforcing that practice. So. There are 13 times in English history between 1285 and 1399 when they outlaw what are called unlawful games, which is anything other than archery <laughs> at any given time. They're like, no billiards, no cocaine, don't be hitting balls in the yard, don't play soccer, like, <laughs> nothing. They're, they're very restrictive about that. And so 13 times they reaffirmed this to try to keep their base of soldiers. But you do see that kind of, that quality issue come up a couple of times because we do see legal issues where um, local authorities will issue like a minimum draw weight, sort of. They, well, not a minimum draw weight, but a minimum distance that you have to be able to shoot as an archer or you won't be able to serve when the time comes. And if you're not able to serve, you get fined. So there's this whole separate like thing to try to keep people as competent as archers as they can and select the best that they can from that group. So it's not like they're taking everybody who could possibly serve. They're gonna take their best bets first, their veterans, their sergeants, that kind of thing, people who have combat experience. And oftentimes those people came home with a lot more than they left with. And so you see, um, Precision use and then cannons very quickly cannons and guns um, And the longbow doesn't have a lot of advantages over cannons and guns other than its accuracy Early on in the world of cannons, like they had cannon on the campaign in 1415 when they ended up at Agincourt they had cannon and used them against Harfleur but that cannon exploded and killed 62 people. Oh. So it was like it was a really consistent way to get the job done yet. Yeah. Um, but as cannon expanded and as gunworks expanded, guns got more accurate. 
you see this debate about whether or not longbows should still be used in military service because they're already using so many firearms, so many other things. Um, but this goes on until the 1600s because we see longbows stocked at the tower still until 1625 and then again during the English Civil War, the English, I don't remember which side, but somebody raises two units of archers in Kent in 1642. <laughs> like, that's really, really, really late if you're thinking that this thing is completely militarily outmoded. But it kind of has its place in unarmed combat, or not unarmed combat, but lightly armored combat. I think that's why it saw a momentary resurgence. Um, but I want to talk about head styles for a second, too. Because, like I said earlier, there's that one over there that does, um, that breaks through ring mail. But we also see these on the battlefield quite a bit. And I have a couple of them up pass them around if you guys want to. As well. So these are swallowtail broadheads, and they're remarkably ineffective against armor, mm -hmm. which makes us wonder why we see so darn many of them in combat in 1415 when many people are already in plate. Uh, so those have really broad, wide hooks on them, and they're really a specialist round by this time period. Uh, they're a holdover from the days when you could expect people to be fairly lightly armored if you were beating them in open combat. But what the English found is that as their arrows were less and less effective on armored opponents, they were more and more effective if they just focused on the horses. So, yeah, get up there. I know, I got, I got a crowd wide side. I'm sorry. I love horses myself, but take a look at that head and tell me, yeah, you could bust a hole in it, and even if it's not lethal, you don't have to be lethal to a horse to get him out of the game. You know, all you have to do is scare him a little bit. <laughs> Most of them are off and running, um, but that leaves, it leaves such a wound that just continues to drag around, and they're often not even blue hot. So, that's the other thing. So what they do is they rain these down by the thousands on the French, and you have to imagine, even if this isn't making it through your armor, this is making a big impact. It's not going to be pleasant to have these raining down on you, and if it does find the odd crevice in your armor where it's weak, it will go in and it will kill you. So, and that is a heck of a way to die. As a side note of <coughs> trivia, the King of England during the Battle of Agincourt, who was personally there, Henry V, received an arrow to the face directly under his eye at the Battle of Shrewsbury and recovered from it with the help of a doctor who invented a tool to pull the arrowhead out of his brain. So he raised his helmet to get a breath during the Battle of Shrewsbury, and he got one of these guys under his left eye lodged against the back of his skull. He spent four days with the head still in his skull <laughs> before they pulled it out. So Surgeon John Bradmore, who had recently been jailed for cutting up dead bodies, <laughs> uh, invented a tool that was essentially an extractor screw that they plunged into the wound, drilled the end into oh. the remaining wood at the back of the arrowhead, and yanked it from his skull. Uh, and Hal refused to be painted from his left side for the rest of his life which tells us that there was maybe bigger than just a little beauty mark there. <laughs> oh, how are we doing, guys? Does anybody have questions? Anybody want to over? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, the first one is you mentioned that how uh, some archers would work for a knight. Is a knight someone who would be hired by a warrior? So, the, the status system of the time is 
odd and complicated, and I don't fully understand it. But essentially, like you, retainers work either for a knight or a lord or a baron or whoever, and they're in the direct service of that person instead of in the service of the state. So we get this mix of actual direct military contracts at the time where the government or the king's um, exchequer is paying soldiers directly and where they're paying sergeants or retainers who are then fighting for that war. Yeah. So it's it's a mix. It's not quite like they're paying everybody. Sometimes they're paying archers directly in certain corps. Sometimes they're paying for a whole retainer of troops that they know are under the command of a certain person. Makes sense. Um, right. And 